All right, so if, as most of you know, if not all of you know already, we got the, we went over in the announcements. We've been talking about it for quite a while. We've got the soul winning mega marathon coming up this Saturday. And I decided that, you know what, I want to preach a sermon to try to help you get, be encouraged and be excited about this event. And if you've been on the fence, if you're not sure if you're going to make it or not, I want to just, just help push you over the edge and decide, you know what, we're going to show up, we're going to go, we're going to do this, I'm going to be there, I'm going to do something with my life. If I haven't been soul winning before, I'm going to learn how to do soul winning. I'm going to try to, to bring somebody to Christ and be part of this big event and this big day. Amen. I like having big days. Now, you could say, Grant, Pastor Burson, we should be soul winning all the time. Amen. You should be soul winning every day of your life. You should be talking about Jesus. You should live, eat, breathe, sleep, Jesus Christ. Yes, amen, we should do that. But not everyone's doing that, okay? And besides, there's nothing wrong just because, yeah, we should be doing as much as we can every single day. Big events are great. It's still fun to have something to get excited about. It's fun to get other people excited about and, and bring the interest because not everyone is always Mr. or Mrs. Hyper-Spiritual all the time. Right. And everyone needs to start somewhere. Everybody needs to start somewhere. And big events like this are great for bringing people in that maybe you've been saved for decades, but you've never, you've been afraid, you've been scared, you don't know what to do, and, and, and you kind of just feel like, well, maybe that's not for me, or whatever, whatever the reasoning is, whatever the excuses are, whatever it is you've been telling yourself, events like this can help people overcome whatever those obstacles are because it's a big deal, because it's a lot of fun, because everyone's going to be there. We're going to have everybody out doing this, and you can be part of something much bigger on this day. And what's really cool about this mega marathon is that it's not just something that our church is doing. It's something that's taking place all over the United States and all over the world. Amen. There's one day where people that are like-minded have decided to, hey, let's all go out on the same day. Let's all take time out of our schedules, out of our lives on this one day. Let's all go out there and knock on some doors and try to get in conversations with people and try to get people saved. Amen. That's what this day is all about. It's exciting. And look, if you're visiting this church for the first time, you've never been here before, you're newer to this church, you need to understand that this is what this church is all about. Amen. There may be, there's many things that you're going to you're going to hear from this church, hear uh, taught and preached, but this is the pulse of the church. This is what our mission is. This is what our objective is as New Testament believers is to tell other people about Jesus Christ. It's a very, very, very simple plan that God has for us in this lifetime. We are here for a very short time period. And if you could think about uh, any one moment in your life that has been pivotal, one very important moment ought to be the time that you got saved where your, your eternal destination changed from a hell-bound sinner to a, to a, a saved, heaven-bound believer. That is a huge event. And I don't know about you, but I am really, really, really thankful that I had the opportunity to hear the gospel preached in my lifetime so that I was able to make that decision to put my faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. And it would not have been possible if there weren't people actively talking about and preaching Jesus Christ. It doesn't happen. Right. The Bible says, faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. And how shall they hear without a preacher? Right. People will not be hearing the word of God and will not be able to get saved by putting their faith in the word of God without a preacher being sent. This, I mean, this is more important than any. This is what our life should be about. Right. I mean, what is your life about? Is it about just making a lot of money and accumulating things and having a nice place to live and having air conditioning and two vehicles? I mean, is that what your life is about? That's pretty sad. Yeah. Yeah. If that's what it all boils down to, that's pretty sad. Yeah. Oh, but you don't understand. I'm going to have a boat and I'm going to have a vacation. That's <laughs> pathetic. It really is. It's sad. If, if that is what your goal is to be to have life, it's all for nothing. Yeah, that's right. 
because it's all going to be gone. You're going to waste your time. You're going to realize none of those things really bring you happiness. None of those things really bring you joy. You know, the Bible is true. Every verse, every line, over and over and over again. And when Jesus Christ said it's more blessed to give than to receive, hey, that's a very, very true statement. And anyone who's ever honestly given, given of themselves, whether it be something, you know, some financial thing or something that costs you money, anything that you give or giving your time, when you're giving to someone else, that there is way more joy and peace and comfort that comes from that. There's so much more that you gain by giving than just by whatever you receive from people. And look, it's nice to receive. It's nice to get things from you. It's nice, it's nice to feel loved. It's nice to get gifts. That's encouraging. That's, it's, it's nice. But it's so much better when you can be on the end where you're giving to someone else and making that impact in their life. That's something that can't be taken away. That's something that doesn't end. That's something where God is going to reward you for also. In addition to just the, the temporal rewards of having that joy. And what better gift can you give than to, to showing people that gift of eternal life and, and showing them how they can receive that gift? And other people having their eternal destinations changed because you decided to sacrifice your time and your effort to go out and, and give people the gospel of Jesus Christ. And look, I'm not going to back down from using language like that because people say, oh, well, it sounds like you're getting the credit. Look, I'm going to prove to you from Scripture that we work together with God. Amen. That does God deserve to credit for our salvation? Amen. Yes, he does. I'm not taking anything away from what Jesus Christ did. I'm not taking anything away from God's love, from God's sacrifice, for what Jesus Christ did for us on the cross. Nothing at all. But the fact remains that if we don't go out and preach the gospel, people will not get saved. Then what, then the, then what happened with Jesus on the cross will end up being in vain. Amen. If we don't go out and do the work that he's appointed for us to do. This is critical. This is the most important thing that you can be spending your time doing. And I'm asking for one day, for one hour of one day, go and do something. Be a part of this group. Be a part of what we're doing. Overcome the fear. Overcome whatever it is that might be preventing you from going out and say, well, this is weird. I don't know what to do. I, I, I don't want to go out and, and show up at somebody's doorstep that I don't know, some stranger. What are they going to think? What are they going to say? Are they going to slam the door in my face? And all these fears and doubts that you may have. We've all been there. Okay, everybody that you see that goes out every single week in this church and knocks on doors, we all know what you're going through. We've been there before. I know I have. You're looking at somebody that's a computer nerd, okay? Think about an introverted computer guy. That's me. That's who I was. It literally made me sick to my stomach, physically sick to my stomach to think about standing in front of a group of people and one time I actually did it. And I did get sick to my stomach and, and was affected by it for a long time afterwards just because of my own fears. But what we're going to do today is we're going to look at some scripture because what you have to do is what I had to do. And what I had to do was to decide, is my own fear going to prevent me from doing what the Bible tells me to do and doing from what God wants me to do and tells me and commands me to do in the Scripture? Yeah, that's good. Because the Bible tells us very clearly what we need to be doing. And you cannot ignore what the Scripture says about this subject at all. There is no other way of interpreting the Scripture. There is no, well, that's just your private interpretation, and I'm going to see it this way. It is so crystal clear. God leaves zero room for doubt about this subject at all. And we're going to look at scripture about this. So at the very least, you can know this is what's expected of me by God. 
and it's up to you to decide what you want to do. But see, we're having this big event. It's going to be a lot of fun. Come on out. Join the group. You won't be alone. We're here to help. We're here to encourage one another and to provoke one another unto love and to good works, as the Bible says in Hebrews chapter 10. That's why we don't forsake the assembling of ourselves together as the manner of some is. We show up to church to, to help each other, provoke each other unto love, to good works. Because it's not always easy to do the good works. It's easier just to be lazy. It's easier to do nothing. It's easier to think about yourself and to, to spend your time doing what you want to do and sitting in front of that TV or doing whatever it is that because you've had such a hard week and well, I just can't do that because me, me, me. Going out and preaching the gospel has nothing to do with you. It's putting the focus on other people. And I guarantee you, if you go out and do this, no matter how bad of a week or how bad of a day that you've been having, it'll lift your spirits. Yep. That's right. Guaranteed. You see, a lot of people nod and a lot of people in agreement. You know what? Those are the people who go out soul winning. I can't tell you how many times I've had some really, really bad days and just did not feel like going out and talking to anybody, right? I'm just irritated. I'm just mad. I'm just upset. I don't want to talk to anybody. But you know what? Sometimes you just force yourself to do it anyways because you know it's the right thing to do. And every single time without fail, when I felt like just saying, you know what? Forget it. No, I'm tired. I don't want to do it. But I decided to go out anyways. Every single time I end up in a much better mood. Wow, I'm so glad I did that. I've never once been you know, thinking, oh, that was just a total waste of time. I shouldn't have done that. Not one time. Man, I wish I didn't come out soul winning. Never happened one time. Yep. Look at Titus chapter number two. The Bible says in verse number 11, For the grace of God that bringeth salvation hath appeared to all men, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lusts, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world, looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us, that he might redeem us from all iniquity and purify unto himself a peculiar people zealous of good works. These things speak and exhort and rebuke with all authority. Let no man despise thee. This is the Apostle Paul instructing Titus, a preacher. And this is some of the things that he's saying. The grace of God brings salvation. And that grace of God teaches us that we should be denying ungodliness and worldly lust. We should try to live right. We should try to live righteously in this present world. This is what we ought to be doing as we look for that blessed hope, the glorious appearing of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us. And there's that sacrifice. Jesus gave himself for us. Can we give ourselves a little bit yep. for other people? Is that reasonable to, to think that we can do that since Jesus Christ, God in the flesh, gave himself for us? Why did he give himself for us? That he might redeem us from all iniquity, save us from our sins. And he did that. Amen. If you're a believer in Jesus Christ today, you're saved. He's redeemed you from all of your iniquity. Amen. But that's not the only reason why he gave himself for us. He gave himself for us that he might redeem us from all iniquity in verse 14 and purify unto himself a peculiar people. Peculiar means you're kind of different. Peculiar means you're a little strange. Peculiar means like, what are you talking all this Jesus stuff? What are you, some kind of freak? Live, eat, breathe, sleep, Jesus? That's kind of weird. That's why Jesus gave himself for us, that he can redeem us from all iniquity and purify into himself a pure people zealous of good works. Zealous of good works. That's what he wants us to be. He doesn't want us dragging our feet to do good works. He doesn't want us thinking, oh man, I have to, like I was just talking about myself. Sometimes you have to force yourself to go do good works. Jesus wants us to be zealous of good works. Look, I'm just being honest here. When I said that sometimes I don't really feel like going and doing it because I'm in my flesh and you force yourself to do it. Would to God I was never like that. And I'd always be zealous. That's not the case, but this is what Jesus wants for us. He, he's, he's saved us and he, he wants to purify unto himself a peculiar people zealous 
unto good works. This is why we started a church here. This is why there's so many people looking for churches because there's so many churches that have lost that zeal that are not zealous on the good works. They're not very peculiar. They're kind of just like everybody else. You kind of just go and you sit down and you hear something and then you go home and you just continue on about your life and nothing ever changes and nothing's ever different and nobody's getting the gospel preached unto them. And this is why we're here. And this is why I'm extra excited about this year's soul winning marathon because last year's mega marathon is what determined where we decided to move. When I decided it was time to move on and, and, and try start another church, I waited till after the mega marathon results from last year because I wanted to see where are there people who are already excited. I want to know where is there already a peculiar people that, that are zealous unto good works. Where can we go where there's just this great need and there's people hearing the gospel and it's receptive and there's, you know, and you know where that was from last year's results? Atlanta, Georgia. This is where the, the most amount of people were, were interested in going out soul winning. And obviously there are some really good results. There's a lot of fruitful fields here of people that are ready to get saved because the results were great. And I'm looking at that. And, you know, I don't normally address anyone listening online because I'm preaching to the, to the people here in church. But let's face it, there's people out there that are, are wanting to have churches started in their areas. And I would say this, if you want a church starter in your area, why don't you start getting zealous yourself on the good works? Why don't you make it easier on the people who are going to be coming up, who are going to be looking for areas to start a church and, and get as many people motivated as you can? Do what you can. Do whatever it is that you can to stir people up. If there weren't some of the people here that are in this room even today doing the things that they were doing, this church might not have existed. But it does because the church itself is, is so much more than just one person or one pastor or one leader. It's, it's, it's a whole group of people. And it's people who, in our case, for sure, are like-minded. We love God. We want to serve God. We want to help people grow. We want to do more for other people and and especially giving, getting them saved by giving them the gospel. Turn to, um, turn to 2 Peter, no, actually turn to 1 Corinthians 3. Turn to 1 Corinthians 3. Because I want to get into, there's so much that you could say, but I want to prove from Scripture why this is so important. So we're going to start off with just a very few basics. And you want to start off with, first of all, just talking about your own time. Like, what else do you really have to do with your time? And if you, if you could think about things in a grand scheme, in a grand scale, we only have so many days, so many hours, so many years to live on this earth before we die, before our, our, our physical body is going to pass away. And we go into eternity. We have eternal life. But there's only so much that we can fill our time with here. And it's easy to get distracted with all the cares of this world. But I want you to seriously think about how important are the things that you do. Can you take even one day out of that schedule and out of that life just to give back? Just to say thanks? Thanks? Just to show God, hey God, I'm going to do something for you today. I'm going to do something for someone other than myself. I'm going to help people in a way that you cannot do, you cannot help someone any better than pointing them to eternal life. You could lose everything in this whole world, but if your soul is saved, then praise God. I want you all to think about a time before you were saved. Before you put your faith and trust in Jesus Christ. What, however old you were, it doesn't matter. Think about a time before you were saved. Think about a moment in your life before you ever even heard the gospel. What if you would have died? Didn't even hear the gospel. Well, we know what if. There's no what if. What if you would have gone to hell? 
Jesus Christ said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. There is no, oh, well, it wasn't that bad. That's what I used to think. Oh, I'm really not that bad. I'm not going to go to hell. Well, you know what? I wasn't trusting in Jesus, so yeah, I would have. Because he is the way, the truth, and the life. There is no other way. The Bible says, Neither is there salvation in any other, for there is none other name under heaven given among men, whereby we must be saved. We need the name of Jesus Christ. We need to preach the name of Jesus Christ. In order for you to be saved, you need to put your faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. And what a shame it would be if people weren't out there preaching the word. Like I said, I know I'm thankful for the people that have been involved in my life. And I don't even know who all of them were. I didn't have a soul winner knock on my door and give me a nice presentation of the gospel. That would have been great. But I know for a fact I heard along the way because faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. There's no way I could have, I could have gotten saved otherwise. I thank God that he wants us to be saved and doesn't just leave us without a light even though we're sinners against him. The Bible says that God's not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. You're in 1 Corinthians chapter number 3. I thank God that he's given us ministers. Ministers in order for us to believe. And this is where we're going to start showing you that God has given us this work to do. Just as you have had people appointed unto you to preach the gospel to you, God wants to use you as a minister to be appointed for someone else to get saved. 1 Corinthians 3, look at verse number 5. The Bible says, Who then is Paul and who is Apollos, but ministers by whom ye believed? Basically, he's, you know, he's talking to the church of Corinth here, and they're kind of getting involved and in following their different leaders and say, Well, I'm of Paul, I'm of Apollos, I'm of Cephas, I'm of Christ. And they're trying to say, you know, I'm following this man, this man, this man. And you say, Well, who, who are all these people anyways? All we are is ministers. Minister means you're a servant. You're, you're ministering to someone else's needs. You are serving them. He says, all we are ministers by whom you believed, but then he follows it up with, even as the Lord gave to every man. That's a great statement. Even as the Lord gave, God gave ministers to every man. Just one more reason why God is just. God is just in all that he does. Because God wants everyone to be saved equally. Jesus Christ came and died for all the sins of the whole world, for everybody. And not, not for ours only, but for the sins of the whole world, the Bible says, for everybody. And God has given ministers in order for people to believe. He's not trying to hide his word. He wants it to be made known. The Bible says in verse 6, I have planted, Apollos watered, but God gave the increase. So then neither is he that planteth anything, neither he that watereth, but God that giveth the increase. Of course, God gets the credit and glory and honor for, for the souls being saved. God's the one giving increase. We are laborers. We're here to do work. We're ministers. God ultimately does the saving of the soul. Verse number eight, now he that planteth and he that watereth are one and every man shall receive his own reward according to his own labor. For we are laborers together with God. Ye are God's husbandry. Ye are God's building. So he teaches us here, we do work together with God. We are laborers. It is work. It's not easy. It does require sacrifice. It does require you to go out and do something that you wouldn't normally do. It's going to require you to sacrifice your time and your energy to go out and do this. But this is what God has, God has appointed for us. Turn to chapter number four. Excuse me, 2 Corinthians chapter four. 2 Corinthians chapter four. Let's 
2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse number 1, the Bible reads, Therefore, seeing we have this ministry, as we have received mercy, we faint not. Now, in order to understand what ministry is he talking about in context, we have to go back to chapter 3. So he's saying, therefore, seeing we have this ministry. What ministry is he talking about? Look at uh, verse 6 of chapter 3. Who also hath made us able ministers of the New Testament. This is where he mentions ministering. You know, if you, if you go back in context, ministers of the New Testament, not of the letter, but of the Spirit. For the letter killeth, but the Spirit giveth life. He's talking about preaching the gospel, the new covenant, the new testament in Jesus Christ. This is the ministry. So verse 1 in chapter 4 says, Therefore, seeing we have this ministry, this is our work, this is our ministry, this is what we need to do. As we have received mercy, we faint not. He's saying we don't stop, we don't faint, we don't fall over. Why? Because as we've received mercy, God saved our souls. God's been long-suffering and merciful unto us. So therefore, we are going to turn around and not faint. We are going to persevere. We are going to continue. Verse number two, but have renounced the hidden things of dishonesty, not walking in craftiness nor handling the word of God deceitfully, but by manifestation of the truth, commending ourselves to every man's conscience in the sight of God. And this is important too. It says that we renounce the hidden things of dishonesty. We don't walk in craftiness or handling the word of God deceitfully. And this is just kind of a side note. This wasn't in my notes to go over it. But when we go out and preach the gospel, you should never, ever be using the word of God deceitfully. And what I mean by that is taking verses out of context just to try to prove some point. And you know what? I don't care if the point that you're trying to make is true. Don't back up a true, a true point with verses that do not apply to what you're trying to say. That is only going to cause hurt and damage. It doesn't matter if what you're saying is true. Don't back it up with verses that aren't talking about that. Make sure you understand the context of the verses that you use to try to preach to people. Because if someone goes back and checks you on it, and they say, oh, well, I can't believe this guy because he's using this verse for me, and it has nothing to do with that. So why would they believe anything else that you say? So we need to be careful and not use the word of God deceitfully. And we're not trying to trick people or hoodwink people into getting saved. That's not what it's all about. We care about the truth. We want honesty and reality and truthfulness. And that's why when we go out, we're also not just trying to get people to repeat some prayer. Amen. That's not soul winning. Right. We're not just trying to see what we can do to get someone to, do, let me just see if I can get them to repeat this prayer. That's meaningless unless you can get through to their heart. That's right. We care about being true and genuine and bringing the truth to these people so that they can see and understand and believe. I'm not using deceit or trickery or trying to pull anything over on people. There's plenty of false prophets out there doing that already because they don't care about the people. They care about bringing them into church and getting their money. But that's not what we're all about. These people can never come to our church. Of course, we want them to come. We want them to grow. We want them to get disciples. We want them to go out and bring the gospel to even more people. But the most important thing that we focus on when we go out soul winning is their soul. They're understanding the truth. They're putting their faith from their heart on Jesus Christ. So in order for us to do that, we got to make sure we're not handling the word of God deceitfully. We're not walking in craftiness. But by manifestation of the truth, commending ourselves every man's conscience in the sight of God. Verse number three, but if our gospel be hid, it is hid to them that are lost, in whom the God of this world hath blinded the minds of them which believe not, lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine unto them. If our gospel is hid, if you, if you hide the gospel, look, if you're here today and you're saved, you've already received the gospel. You know the gospel. It's already saved your soul. You can live your whole life and never tell anyone else about the gospel and you still go to heaven because God saved your soul. Amen. But if your gospel is hid, it's hid to them that are lost. And what happens to them that are lost? They're going to hell. I don't know about you, but that doesn't make me feel very easy. That doesn't sit well with me Amen. to think that I'm sitting on eternal life, this great gift. How awesome is that? I didn't have to do anything for it. 
Yay me, I'm so happy I got this and not tell anyone else about it. You have that type of attitude where you don't want to let other people know about such an amazing gift that's free to them. It's not like, oh no, I have it and I don't want anyone else to have it because you're going to have to take mine away from me. No, you get to keep yours and tell other people that they can get the same thing too. It's available for them. You don't have to hide it or hoard it away. But someone who's not willing to do that is a person that hates people. And let that sink in. If you're not willing to tell other people about the good news, about that free gift, about eternal life, about how you can just avoid being tortured and tormented and in flames for an eternity, how you can just avoid that. If you can't tell people that, you hate people. You hate them. There's no other explanation for it. Because that's pretty severe. Eternity in hell. And think about that when you think about any unsaved friends or relatives or whatever, that you're too uncomfortable to bring up religion. You're too uncomfortable to bring up the gospel. You're too uncomfortable to talk about Jesus. Well, when you're that uncomfortable, the next time you see them, I want you to imagine that person engulfed in flames and screaming their living head off because they're so tortured and tormented. And then see if you could muster up the guts to overcome your own fear of what they might think or say if you were to bring up Jesus Christ. And see if that's enough of a motivation to, to talk about it. People are too afraid to just, to just always be polite and end up never talking about the things that really matter. And oftentimes people fear just they don't even know how someone's going to respond. I can't tell you how many times I've been proven wrong over and over again on how I think somebody's going to respond when I bring the, up the gospel. It happens a lot. It still happens. Now, I don't let those thoughts prevent me from giving someone the gospel, but just you, could, you walk up to someone and you're thinking like, yeah, this guy probably isn't going to want to listen to a word I have to say. But you do it anyways because that's where you're out there. Because you care about people. You want to get them saved, right? You want to lead them to Christ. And then you're like, wow, I didn't, th I didn't think that person was going to give me the time, of, the time of day. People that look real rough and gruff and kind of have a nasty look on their face. And you're like, oh, man, I don't think I want to talk to this guy. Listen to every single word. Hear well. Receive Christ. Get saved. Amen. And then there's other people that look like the friendliest people in the world. And they're like, get out of my face. I don't want to have anything to do with you. You just never know. And, and the reason why I'm just bringing this up is because you don't know. Fears come from the unknown. I mean, that's ultimately what, what most people are afraid of. Obviously, there's some other fears if, if something bad's happened to you in the past, or whatever, but still, the fear comes from just you not really knowing what's going to happen. And I'll tell you what, there's nothing that happens out soul winning that should make you afraid nothing take it ask you don't want to take my word for it oh you're the preacher of course you got to say that right you're trying to trying to get everybody out there knocking on doors talk to anybody that's out there doing it they'll tell you the same thing i haven't gotten this many people just so utterly deceived that they're just gluttons for punishment out there because it's it's not bad but you know what even if it were it still wouldn't change what the bible says even if it were even if it were bad, I'm saying it's not bad. It's not like there's, there's any problems or anything to be scared of. You know, there's no one shooting at you or whatever. I don't know. I can't, it's hard to think of something like we're still, we're still not getting arrested yet really for, for preaching the gospel. There's nothing bad about it. That could even be perceived as bad other than you just have to give up some of your time and overcome some fear of the unknown. But that's what we're here for. We'll help you with that. You don't have, you could show up on Saturday and you don't have to open up your mouth one time other than to eat some Chick-fil-A in the morning. All right, eat, eat, eat some chicken and biscuits. Okay, you could fill up with some lemonade and then we'll pair you up with someone else and you just have to stand there next to them. 
They'll do all the talking. Just see what it's like. Be an encouragement. And I'll tell you what, it is encouragement. You say, well, I don't, think, I don't see the point. I don't know how to do this. I'm just going to be more of a burden. No, you won't. You know, it's encouraging every time we see new people go out soul winning. It encourages everybody. I know, I know it's not just me. I love seeing people going out like, man, I'm going out soul winning for the first time. Amen. Not a burden at all. It's, it's exciting. Come on with us. And you don't have to say anything. Just come on with us. Just see, just see how we do this. Be a part of it. You have to open up your mouth, but you can pray. Pray that there's no distractions. Pray that God will open up this person's heart. Pray that they'll be able to see and understand the gospel. Come along with us and see why we're so crazy. <laughs> why we're so peculiar weirdos. They're just talking about this all the time. Why, why is it in the bulletin? Why do you have a sign out there? Why do you talk about this so much, Pastor Burzens? Come along and find out. Seriously. And then this isn't in my notes either, but I, I need to go over this because there are way too many people these days that are dealing with depression, dealing with being sad. And I'm being serious now. There are people out there that, that have problems with being depressed and have problems understanding their way in life and, and what they're supposed to do. And all of that stems from and stay with me here. It stems from a self-centered approach on things. The sadness and the grief that goes along with depression is a result of people looking in at themselves and looking at things that they don't have and looking at things that have gone wrong and looking at me, me, me. And I'll tell you what, if I just spent my time focusing in on me, I'd probably start to get kind of sad too. <laughs> And I think anybody, any sinner, when you start looking at yourself, you can find lots of reasons to kind of get depressed, to kind of be sad about whatever, things that aren't going the way you planned. And now, man, now I'm, I'm 42 years old and what have I done with my life and where am I going and, you know, whatever. Okay, all these different thoughts. But the thoughts, are, it, you know, the depressing thoughts are just focused on me, 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 me. If you can flip that to say, I'm not really going to worry about myself. I'm not going to worry myself. I'm going to think about what can I do to help other people out. That is the solution for depression. And I, don't, I don't really care what the reason is why you're depressed. When you can stop thinking about your situation where you are and start thinking about someone else's life and what's going on with them and how you can help them, then you'll start to understand what Jesus meant when he said it is more blessed to give than to receive. Then you'll stop worrying about everything that's going wrong in your life and you can focus on other people. And when you start helping them, oh man, the joy that comes along with that. Because that's when you have a Christ-like attitude and a mindset when you can esteem others better than yourself and sacrifice of yourself and you can bear that cross and go forward and, and care and worry about how you can help other people succeed. That is what Jesus Christ came here to do. That was his attitude. He came here for you. He didn't come here for himself. He didn't come to lift up a throne. He came here to be crucified on a cross. He came here to suffer shame and humiliation and work for other people and go out and perform and heal, perform the miracles, heal the sick, do everything that he did for you. It was never about himself. He was a minister and he gave us the example of what we need to be like. And if we have that, we can have joy. That's called walking in the spirit. And when you walk in the spirit, you get to enjoy the fruits of the spirit. The Bible says the fruit of the spirit is love, joy, peace, Long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith. <coughs> the exact opposite of depression. Right. Test me on it, anyone who's having problems with depression or being sad or not knowing what to do. Test me on it. What have you got to lose? You're already depressed. What have you got to lose? Try it out. I'm not, I'm not kidding. I'm not joking. What have you got to lose? Try focusing on someone. 
See what you can do for them and then see how depressed you end up being. And try to follow that pattern. It'll help. I promise you. And what, what's great about that is it's mutually beneficial. You're helping someone else and you're helping yourself. It's a win-win. Let's keep reading here in 2 Corinthians chapter 4 because I don't even think I finished the passage where I wanted to, to keep reading here. It says um, in verse number 4, in verse number four, in whom the God of this world hath blinded the minds of them which believe not, lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine unto them. For we preach not ourselves, but Christ Jesus the Lord, and ourselves your servants for Jesus' sake. For God, who commanded the light to shine out of darkness, hath shined in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. But we have this treasure in earthen vessels that the excellency of the power may be of God and not of us. And basically, he's talking about how, you know, we've got this, this light to shine and, and to shine forth by, by preaching the gospel. And, and he says, but we have this treasure, this great precious gift in an earthen vessel just to show that the glory and the excellency come from the power of God, that it's not, it's not just us mere sinners, humans that, are, that have this power to bring. It's, it's totally of God, which is why he uses our weak, uh, sinful people to, to go out and shine this truth so that he gets all the glory and it's not of our own wisdom or, or cunning or craftiness or anything like that. Flip over to chapter 5, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse number 18. The Bible says, And all things are of God, who hath reconciled us to himself by Jesus Christ, and hath given to us the ministry of reconciliation. Here's another place where the scripture is telling us that this is our job. He's given unto us this ministry, the ministry of reconciliation. Because it says, All things are of God. God's reconciled us to himself by Jesus Christ. How is it that we're reconciled? Well, as sinners, we have a problem with God. We need someone to make it right for us. Because as a sinner, we deserve to be punished. We're not in good standing before God as a sinner. We need to be reconciled. Well, that's what Jesus Christ came for so that he can reconcile us back to God. He paid for our sins and said, okay, now you're back in good standing with God because I've taken all of your sin out of the way. I purged you of these sins. So he gave, he's reconciled us, un, us unto God through Jesus Christ, and then he's given us the ministry of reconciliation. It says, To wit that God was in Christ, reconciling the world unto himself, not imputing their trespasses unto them, and hath committed unto us the word of reconciliation. Basically saying that now it's your job. Now that you've been reconciled unto Christ, it's your job to recon, help reconcile other people unto God through Jesus Christ. Verse 20, Now then, we are ambassadors for Christ, as though God did beseech you by us. We pray you in Christ's stead, be ye reconciled to God. This is the mindset that we need to have, and this is the job that we've been given. He says, you're an ambassador. What does an ambassador do? They represent somebody else. They represent some other person in power. Well, we are going, we are ambassadors for Christ. Why do we have to be an ambassador for Christ? Because Christ isn't walking around in this earth right now. He has us here to represent Christ. And since Christ isn't here, that's what he says, but we pray you in Christ's stead. As if Christ were here, he's not here. So in his place, in his stead, we're here to, to tell you, you need to be reconciled to God. We are Christ's ambassador. We're here to tell other people, hey, you need to be reconciled unto God. Verse 21, for he hath made him to be sin for us who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. This is our ministry. This is what we're commanded to do. And like I said before, there, there's no interpretation here. This is what the Bible says. This is a, a ministry of reconciliation that's been committed unto us. It's our job to reconcile people 
to help people get reconciled to God by preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ. Turn to, um, let's see how much time we have left. Turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 9. I have a whole point in here. I'm just deciding if I want to go into this or not. Maybe I will. So this Saturday when we go out soul winning, we're going to an area, and, and again, I don't want anyone to be you know, fearful of things. We're going into not the best of the neighborhoods. Okay, it's not going to be you know, the rich HOA community, and, you know, everybody's got these nice houses and stuff. And there's a good reason for that. Now, it is our job and our ministry to reach everybody with the gospel of Jesus Christ. And we're commanded to go out and preach the gospel to every creature. And that's our job. And that's what we're going to do. So, Lord willing, we'll, we'll reach, we'll try to attempt to reach everybody. But you know who we're going to go to first? First, we're going to go to the poor people. First, we're going to go to those neighborhoods that aren't quite as good, where people don't quite have as much money. And there's a very good scriptural reason for that also. Because Jesus Christ himself said, I'll read this for you in Luke 18. He said, How hardly shall they that have riches enter into the kingdom of God? For it is easier for a camel to go through a needle's eye than for a rich man to enter into the kingdom of God. And they that heard it said, who then can be saved? And he said, the things which are impossible with men are possible with God. Jesus Christ himself is saying how hard it is for someone who's rich to get saved. When we go out soul winning, we want people to get saved. That's our goal is for people to put their faith in Christ. So if there's a segment of people that's just, it's going to be really, really, really hard for them to, to get saved, we're not going to go to them first. We'll still go to them. We're going to go to them last, though, because we want to reach the people who are going to be a lot easier to get saved, a lot easier to, to lead the Christ. And the reason why the rich people are so hard to get saved is because they have pride. Because they don't feel like they need God because they have everything that they could possibly want. So what do they need a God for? What do they need a Savior for? I've got myself taken care of. I'm just fine. And it's that attitude that prevents people from getting saved. But when you go to an area where people don't have that attitude because they don't have very much and they need help and you don't need to tell them that they need help, they are already living it and they realize, I need some help. I need some guidance. I need a hand. Those are people who are going to be a lot more likely to put their faith in a Savior and get saved because they've already been brought low. They're humble. They, they realize they need help. They need a Savior. A lot more likely, a lot more frequent. Now, not everybody, but that's the reason why there's so many more people that are in poorer areas that are going to turn to Christ than people who are in rich neighborhoods. And if you don't believe me, and if you don't believe Jesus, then go ahead and, and try it for yourself. I've preached through all, all types of different neighborhoods. This is a fact. This is true. We need to, to learn to not be respecters of persons. The Bible says, I'll read this for you in James 2, My brethren, have not the faith of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Lord of glory, with respect of persons. For if there come unto your assembly a man with a gold ring and goodly apparel, and there come in also a poor man in vile raiment, and ye have respect to him that weareth the gay clothing, and say unto him, Sit thou here in a good place, and say to the poor, Stand thou there, or sit here under my footstool. Are ye not then partial in yourselves, and are become judges of evil thoughts? Hearken, my beloved brethren, hath not God chosen the poor of this world, rich in faith, and heirs of the kingdom which he hath promised to them that love him? The Bible says that God's chosen the poor 
poor physically, poor financially, of this world, to be rich in faith. Just as it's hard for the man that's trusting in his riches to be saved, it's easy for someone who's poor because God has given them, made them to be rich in faith. It says, But ye have despised the poor. Do not rich men oppress you and draw you before the judgment seats? Do not they blaspheme that worthy name by the which ye are called? If you fulfill the royal law according to the scripture, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself, you do well. But if you have respect to persons, you commit sin and are convinced of the law as transgressors. Don't ever think, oh, I don't want to go to that area and preach the gospel to those people. Whether you think you're too good for it or whether you think that well, it's just not safe. Well, you know what? If you go out with the, with the attitude and the mindset of loving people to preach the gospel, do you know that God's able to, to protect you? Do you know that God's able to, to make sure that you can go through whatever area if, if he's going to use you to get people saved, do you know that God wants those people to get saved? Right. And if God wants those people to be saved and you're willing to offer yourself up to preach the gospel to these people, don't you think that God's capable of making sure that you get to the people he wants to get saved without being injured, without, without having a problem? Of course he is. There's one other, there's one thing I, I just got to get off my chest. I have it written in my notes here too because I don't want to forget. <laughs> I've already heard this, I don't know how many times, when I tell people we started a church in Norcross. They're like, oh yeah, those people really need the gospel. They really need Jesus there. That's irritating. Because you know what? Everybody needs the gospel. And you know, usually the people who are told, oh yeah, those people really need it. Usually those are the people that need to hear the gospel because they're self-righteous and they think that, oh yeah, those, they really need to hear the gospel. No, everyone needs to hear the gospel. Everyone needs to get saved. But not even just that. <laughs> If you were to determine who needs the gospel just based on a ratio, I would say the rich neighborhoods probably need the gospel more. The percentage of people who are actually saved in the rich neighborhoods versus in the poor neighborhoods, there's probably a lot fewer people saved. They'd probably say, well, they need it even more. But they're the ones looking down their nose saying, oh, yeah, they really need, they really need Jesus over there. Now, it's true that, that neighborhoods that, that have a lot of vice and a lot of crime, they do need the Bible. They need to hear righteousness and righteous preaching. Absolutely. But the people that are talking about this, they're saying they need the gospel. And they do, but everyone needs the gospel. And there's a big difference. You're in 1 Corinthians chapter 9. Let's look at verse number 16. The Bible says, For though I preach the gospel, I have nothing to glory of, for necessity is laid upon me. Yea, woe is unto me if I preach not the gospel. It is our duty to preach the gospel. This is not optional. It's not optional. Now, obviously, you have free will. I mean, God, you know, that's between you and God. Whether or not you choose to obey God. And our church, we don't have a rule that says you must do this. That's between you and God. But I'm going to preach what the Bible teaches. And this is what the Apostle Paul said. He says, for though I preach the gospel, I have nothing to glory of. For what? He's saying, I can't glory about all of my preaching of the gospel. I can't get all this credit because, oh, I'm this great soul winner. Look, I'm going out and doing this. And I'm going out and doing this. He's saying, basically, if I don't do it, then woe unto me because I have to do this. This is just my job. He said, I'm not anyone to be looked up to as, oh, man, you're doing all this great. You know, no, I'm just doing what I'm, what I'm told to do. I'm doing what God told me to do. And if I don't do it, then woe on me. Verse 17, for if I do this thing willingly, I have a reward. He's saying, hey, if I choose to do this and, and I want to do this and it's willing, 
then you know what? God's going to bless me for that and God's going to give me rewards. Amen. He says, but if against my will, dispensation of the gospel is committed unto me, what is my reward then? Verily, that when I preach the gospel, I may make the gospel of Christ without charge, that I abuse not my power in the gospel. For though I be free from all men, yet have I made myself servant unto all, that I might gain the more. And this is, I mean, he's speaking here. The gospel has to be without charge. Man, what a wicked thing would that be to say, yeah, I could tell you how you could live forever. I could tell you how you can get eternal life. But you got to pay 50 bucks to sit in the front row or whatever, and 25 bucks for standing room only and, and start, start charging people just to hear the good news. Why? Because you received it freely. Freely you've received, freely you should give. And... I have a hard time with that verse just because it's so against what I think anyone who, who's born again should have in their mind. But you know what? It's in the Bible. And it's something that, uh, you know, no one ought to have a wicked heart like that of thinking that you can make the, the gospel of Christ with charge and abuse your power in the gospel. But I like what he says here, and this is the mindset we're going to close with, and this is what we need to remember. Verse number 20, or verse number 19, we'll read that again. For though I be free from all men, yet have I made myself servant unto all, that I might gain the more. He's saying, I'm free from all men. I'm not in bondage to anyone. I'm not working for anyone. I work for myself. I'm self-employed. I'm not a servant to anyone, but you know what I do? I make myself a servant unto all just to reach more people. So I'll make myself a servant to whoever in order to reach through to them. He says, And unto the Jews I became as a Jew that I might gain the Jews. To them that are under the law as under the law that I might gain them that are under the law. To them that are without law as without law, being not without law to God, but under the law to Christ, that I might gain them that are without law. To the weak became I as weak that I might gain the weak. I am made all things to all men that I might by all means save some. The heart and the mind, the attitude, I'm going to be whatever it takes, all things, all men, just to save them. Because I'm interested in that soul being saved. If that means going down to their neighborhood where I think it might be a little bit unsafe or dirty or whatever, I'm going to go. And you know what? I'm going to be just like anyone else down there. I'm going to be just like one of them, wherever that is. I'm going to be just like one of these guys. Obviously, he's still holding to standards. He says, you know, them without the law, I'm going to be like I'm without the law too. He says, being not without law to God, but under the law to Christ. And basically, I'm not going to break God's commandments to get through to these people. And again, this is another important aspect to understand because you've got these social gospel people out there these days that'll tell you to go ahead and get drunk with people and go to bars and all in, in the name of giving the gospel of Jesus Christ. Look, we still are under the law to Christ but we're going to approach these people in a manner that we're going to try to get on their level and try, to, and try to find some common ground and try to just be able to talk to them in order to reach them. Wherever they're at, just try to reach them. We're still going to keep ourselves pure in the sight of God, but we're going to try to reach people the best we can. Becoming all things to all men that I might by all means save some. And notice he says that I might by all means save some. So when we go around and we ask how many people got saved today, how many people did you get saved? If you have a problem with that language, then you've got a problem with Paul's language. Because he's saying, I'm becoming all things and I might save some. Now, did the Apostle Paul give credit unto God? Of course he did. We already read those passages. We started out with those passages. He's saying, look, I'm nothing. I just water. I planted. I'm a minister. You know, God's the one who gave the increase. But at the same time, he's saying, you know, we are God's husband. We work together with God. And yes, God's the one who has the power to save a soul. But that soul's not getting saved if I'm not preaching the gospel to that person. So when he says, I got that person saved, it's an accurate statement to make. And we're not saying that to just bring glory on ourselves, just like the Apostle Paul isn't. It's an, it's an appropriate term, but um, 
we want we want to talk about people who get saved. I, I like keeping track of that. I like that we have our bulletin. This is exciting. It encourages me. These aren't just just numbers on a page. I mean, these are all individuals. I mean, you could, everybody here can that, that's won someone to Christ can think back about the people that you got saved, yeah. that you led to Christ. They're all real people. That's right. You can go back and start thinking in your mind about, oh yeah, there was this person. Oh yeah, there was Alan. Oh yeah, there was, you know, Jose. There was, the, you know, and you start thinking about people in your mind. They're real people. Yeah. And even if you never see them again, they decided to put their profession of faith in Jesus Christ. Praise the Lord for that. That's exciting. And especially when you realize what those numbers represent, it's even more exciting. How many people can we reach? That's what it's about. It's not about lifting up ourselves. It's about motivating each other. Hey, come be a part of this. Let's, let's try to reach even more. That's why we have out there now, there's a goal of how many people we're trying to reach with the gospel of Christ, with the man hours that we have, with the people that we have doing it. I want to increase that goal. Why? Because it's about reaching more people. We've got an event this Saturday to reach people. Saturday. What are you doing with your Saturday? You can plant a garden, do some lawn work, clean up around the house, go have some fun. What do you think about sacrificing one day or one part of one day to help someone else out? And, and what a great day to do it, too. I love, I love that this takes place the day before Easter. I mean, we're getting ready to celebrate the resurrection of Jesus Christ. The fact that he conquered death and hell and rose again from the dead, giving us the blessed hope that one day we'll have a resurrection just like Jesus was resurrected? It's the right time to do it. Let's tell other people about the resurrection. Let's tell people about their faith in the resurrection of Jesus Christ. This Saturday, join us. Help us. Become part of the team. Be excited about it. Don't think, oh man, we got to do this. But I had so many other things I wanted to do. I wanted to go to the lake. At the end of the day, you'd have a lot more fun or a lot more joy. Let's put it that way. We have a lot more joy leading someone to Christ than you would have in those moments you have sitting by the water or fishing or whatever you're doing. And look, I'm not against fishing or having fun. It's great. But take some time to give back you received a free gift. Help tell other people about that. Let's bow our heads have a word of prayer. Dear Lord, we love you. We thank you so much for this the abundant grace and mercy that you bestowed upon us um, and by the, that precious gift of salvation. Lord, help us to be able to reach more people and to, to share that great news and to be undeterred, Lord. Help us to, to constantly be um, overcoming our flesh and have the, the proper spirit about us and mindset where we can esteem others better than ourselves and truly have a Christ-like attitude. Lord, we, we love you. We want to serve you. And uh, we love other people. God, help us to, to reach the people in this area. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.